We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be here today. And I've been asked to talk to you about the human ape differences in language. So let's have a look at that. Where did language come from? It seems really different from, and a lot more complex, than the communication systems of other animals. This has given rise to a debate in language evolution circles called the discontinuity paradox. What we are able to convey through our communication system outstrips anything that any other species is able to communicate. We can talk, or sign about the past and the future, hypothetical situations, what might be, abstract concepts and things that have never existed and never will exist in the real world. And yet, if we want to adhere to an evolutionary perspective on human behavior, which we should in Carla, language has to have come from somewhere evolutionarily. It didn't just spring like Athena from the brow of Zeus, fully formed. So do we just have more of the same communicative resources as other animals? Or is our communicative toolkit unique? One of the first things that comes to mind when people generally think about language is what linguists call reference, the ability to refer to things in the world with spoken or gestural signs. Reference can be of three different types, according to a classification scheme proposed in the late 19th century by the brilliant American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce. An index depends for its reference on the physical presence of the thing it refers to at some point in space and time. If the object were not present, there would be no indexical sign. We all know quite well what this means nowadays. So smoke is a reliable index of fire. A weather vane can only show which direction the wind is blowing when there's actually wind blowing. And a bullet hole can only exist if there was a bullet at some point. Perhaps the best example of an index is your index finger. It doesn't mean anything by itself or when you just wave it around. But if you point it at something, it picks up its reference from the thing or person that you point to. Apes, in fact, use indexical gestures to indicate particular conspecifics. An icon, such as a painting of a saint in the Orthodox churches, refers by sharing perceived physical similarities with the thing it represents, with emphasis on perceived physical similarities. This is frequently the problem I have with computer icons because I usually can't figure out what they're supposed to mean. A symbol is what we humans usually think of when we think of reference, because we have language. A symbol has an arbitrary relationship with the thing it refers to. It generally doesn't share physical properties with it. There are some exceptions that we can talk about. Nor does the object referred to need to have ever been physically present for the referential relationship to hold. These distinctions are not just academic. When left to their own devices, animals don't use symbols. They naturally rely on icons and indices to communicate. A number of different animals, chimps, bonobos, Gorillas, orangutans, border collies, dolphins, and parrots have been trained to use various types of symbolic systems under experimental conditions in human-controlled environments. The record for the largest vocabulary goes to this border collie who learned names for 1,022 different toys, which you see here in the picture. It may seem odd to you that this is so rare, but that's only because you were lucky enough to be born into a human cultural setting. You also have a brain with a ready ability to process symbols when exposed to them. 
So-called wild children lack the cultural support to acquire symbolic processing on their own. And even very well-off individuals with lots of cultural support, but extreme sensory deprivation, like Helen Keller, struggle as she did until her epiphany at the water pump to understand that D-O-L-L -L actually refers to the doll and doesn't simply co-occur with it. Even entire highly civilized human societies struggle with symbolic representation. Each time writing systems have emerged in human history, in Egypt, in China, in Samaria, and in Mesoamerica, in other words, long after symbolic representation had already become firmly established in spoken human languages, humans have reverted right back to good old familiar iconic representation. It was only over thousands of years that writing systems moved slowly in the direction of arbitrary representation, because iconic representation just gets cumbersome over time. So let's face it and give the animals a break. Symbolic representation is just really hard, even for humans. Symbolic reference or arbitrariness is on the list of crucial characteristics of human language, proposed in 1960 by Charles Hockett. So that's our first human ape difference. While we can teach some apes raised in a human cultural environment to use a few hundred symbols, they never do anything like this on their own. This brings us to another crucial feature of reference, the ability to refer to things not present in the immediate communicative situation, or to refer to things displaced in space and time. We can talk about Gandhi, who is long deceased, and his drive for Indian independence, which we didn't witness, from colonial rule of the British Empire, which no longer exists, on the other side of the globe in the previous century. As with arbitrary reference, bonobos and border collies have been trained to comprehend some aspects of displaced reference. They can retrieve objects upon request that are outside the room they're in. But you can take a linguistics 101 class virtually anywhere in the world, and sooner or later, you're going to hear about the honeybee dance. Why? Because it's the only naturally occurring communication system in the animal kingdom that provides solid evidence of displaced reference, thanks to a century of research since Kauf and Flisch. The honeybee dance performed in or in some species or under certain circumstances on the hive refers to a food source at some distance from the location where it is performed. Inside the hive, the straight run of the dance has to be transposed from solar to gravitational orientation with a degree of deflection from the gravitational angle standing in for the angle of deflection of the food source from the current location of the sun. So it's a pretty impressive feat. But what you will likewise hear in that Linguistics 101 class is that there's only one thing that honeybees can communicate about, namely a food source. Aside from that, this instance of displaced reference isn't symbolic. It's purely indexical and iconic. The straight run points to the food source. That's indexical. And the slower the straight run, the farther the food source is from the hive. That's iconic. Okay, so that's reference, which is usually the only thing that most people think about with regard to language anyway. But now let's talk about some other features of human language that are well known to linguists, but that you may never have thought about before. We just talked about letters and the development of writing systems. But letters are just a cultural artifact and don't accurately reflect a spoken language's sound system especially when its pronunciation has changed drastically over hundreds of years, like in English and French. It's in the organization of the sound system of a language that we really begin to see its beauty, elegance, and economy. By themselves, the individual sounds of a language are, of course, meaningless. But these basic meaningless sounds can be combined and recombined to create an increasing number of discrete units, all with different meaning. I could also show the same thing for sign language using the basic manual components that make up a sign, handshake, orientation of the palm, movement, and the place on the body where the sign is produced. Notice here that the letters we use to spell these words don't always accurately or consistently reflect the four same basic sounds that are recombined in each one. Hockett gave this feature the unfortunate name of duality or patterning, which actually gives us tremendous combinatorial resources in our communication system. No naturally or even artificially occurring system of animal communication has this degree of combinatorial flexibility built into it. Monkeys of the Gwenon order, vervets, Campbell's monkeys, putty-nosed monkeys, and Diana monkeys in particular, have all been studied extensively for their alarm call systems. All these species have acoustically distinct calls for different predatory threats. Typically, they distinguish between terrestrial and aerial predators. On the one hand, the mappings between the acoustics of the alarm call and the predator type seem completely arbitrary. 
So here's an example of a leopard call. And this is the eagle alarm call. But research suggests that these alarm calls are actually indexical in nature. They don't refer to a predator so much as indicate that one is around, or at least suspected to be around. As we'll see, several of these species have been shown to combine two or three of these calls in a simple fashion, but the calls retain the exact same structure when combined. For this reason, duality of patterning was for a long time considered to be a unique feature of human language. Until 2015, when a very primitive form of duality of patterning was reported in Australian chestnut-crowned babbler birds. Babblers have two similar calls, flight calls that they produce when traveling to and from the nest, and prompt calls that they produce in the nest to stimulate baby birds to open their mouths and start begging for food. Here are some examples. So you can see it's, it's pretty simple. By splicing and dicing audio recordings of the A and B notes used in both types of calls, researchers were able to show that acoustically, the same notes were used in each call, and behaviorally, the bird's responses to the same individual notes didn't differ. In other words, the individual notes were essentially meaningless by themselves. It was only in response to the two particular combinations of individual notes in the flight and prompt calls that the birds reacted differently. One set of responses to flight calls, as shown in the white bars, and a different response to prompt calls, shown in the gray bars. So this was a big eureka in the language evolution literature. But just as with displaced reference in honeybees, this is the only instance of duality of patterning that's ever been documented in a naturally occurring animal communication system. And its use is limited to making only one functional distinction. And worse news for the scorecard, if you're keeping score, is that this feature was found in dinosaurs and not in primates, let alone apes. So, as with displaced reference in honeybees, whether this is a case of continuity or discontinuity in language evolution is going to depend on whether you're a, well, there's something in the glass kind of person, or a, well, there's hardly anything in the glass kind of person. There's some anecdotal evidence that animals trained to understand spoken English are aware that words are made up of sounds. Irene Pepperberg reported that after being trained on the sounds of refrigerator magnet letters, Alex the Grey Parrot once blurted out in frustration, want a nut, nut a ta. And bonobos that understand spoken English can likely tell the difference between pan and can and fan, but I don't know that they've ever been tested on it formally. The final design feature I'm going to talk about is what Hockett called productivity. The ability to combine meaningful units to create more complex meanings. Crucially, the linguistic notion of compositionality has to hold here as well. The meanings of the individual components have to be preserved in and contribute to the meaning of the whole in a predictable way. So if I say red fox, you can reasonably expect the fox that I'm referring to to look like this and not like any of these foxes, let alone this, whatever it is. But apparently it's real and not Photoshop. Likewise, if I say the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, then you can comprehend what that means without my having to spell it out for you. Based on the cues provided by word order in English, you will know that it's the fox doing the jumping and the dog being jumped over, and not vice versa. Campbell's monkeys seem to have different combinations of calls in association with different stimuli and in different contexts but it's not clear that the component parts have stable, consistent meanings that combine in a compositional way. The monkeys produce this call only in response to leopard growls or eagle shrieks, or the leopard or eagle alarm calls of Diana monkeys with whom they share territory. These are auditory signals of danger. When a tree or a tree branch falls in the forest, another, but less definite, auditory signal of a possible predator, they combine it with this call. When they encounter another group of Campbell's monkeys, however, they combine it with this third call type. And here it's not clear how the meanings of the previous two calls have been preserved in this particular combination. For that, we need to look to the dinosaurs again. In 2016, Suzuki et al. reported basic evidence of compositionality in Japanese great tits uh, related to North American chickadees. One set of calls, the ABC calls, elicit an alerting response in which the birds scan the horizon for threats. 
Another type of call is used to recruit other birds, for example, for the purpose of mobbing predators. And in response, the birds will approach the loudspeaker in playback experiments. When experimenters slice these two calls together as one combined call, in a combination that the birds themselves produce naturally, the birds exhibited both behaviors in response. They scanned the horizon and approached the loudspeaker. But as before, this is the only unequivocal instance of productivity with clear compositionality that has ever been found in the animal kingdom. And again, the point on the scorecard goes to the dinosaurs and not to our brother primates. However, a number of language-trained apes, one of the border collies, and dolphins have been trained to understand and respond appropriately to simple combinations of symbols. Captive apes also seem to be capable of producing some rudimentary but crucial combinations in their gestures, particularly when it comes to sexually related activities. This guy gesturing is really after sex. And if you don't believe me, here's more explicit proof. In the following stills, there seems to be both an indexical gesture or tap indicating, hey you, and then a subsequent motion, both iconic in representing the intended path or direction and indexical in that it ends at the desired goal, that seems to indicate, come here. This is merely an imperative command or request rather than a descriptive statement about some state of affairs in the world. But still, there's both a proposed subject, hey you, and an intended action, come here, which are the building blocks of the subject-predicate relationship proposed by Aristotle. And if this take is accurate, it's the only spontaneously produced subject-predicate relationship that I'm aware of in the animal kingdom. So, finally, score one for the apes. Notably, this gestural combination of sorts has been documented in more than one captive ape species, as you saw from the pictures, in both bonobos and lowland gorillas. But it still has only one functional significance, albeit an important one for reproductive advantage. So let's take stock of where we stand. Where does this leave us with regard to our paradox? Is human language continuous or discontinuous with animal communication? I'm afraid, as you've seen from the evidence, that it's difficult to answer this question definitively, so the debate will have to continue until more evidence is available. Animals of various types in the wild, but so far not apes, have been shown to exhibit individual design features of language in their naturally occurring communication systems. As you can see here, each of them satisfies one of Hockett's criteria, and that's good enough for their natural purposes. If we add in captive apes and are willing to consider their gestures to be true combinations, we can improve their score relative to competing species. And as we've seen throughout, animals trained in human-controlled environments do pretty well in learning to comprehend the use of some of Hockett's design features in a simplified way. But they never arrive at these solutions or produce them on their own when left to their own devices. And no matter how you arrange the scorecard, Pascal will always beat out the competition because he can do all of this and a lot more in at least four languages that I'm aware of and probably more that I'm unaware of. The answer therefore has to lie in the eye of the beholder. I'm dating myself a bit here, so if you don't recognize this image, it's the original book version of this. But in order to solve this particular paradox, for the time being, you'll simply have to decide what kind of person you really are. Thank you.